Using these lines, bringing them in from the very sides of the image, taking them through to the centre. Now I'm using a full frame camera and I'm also using a, a wide angle lens here. I'm shooting at 17mm to maximise this effect and create greater image dynamics. Now, if I look through the frame to start with, I found that these particular uprights are not working for me. What's happening is, is they're actually blocking off the very edges of the uh, frame itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just move the camera forward just a fraction to exclude those, keep the shot nice and straight, make sure my horizon's completely level and that my converging lines start in the very corners of the frame. So pulling me right through the scene. I'm using a graduated filter on top. Again, this is balancing the sky with the water as well. Just a small tweak to the zoom. Press the button. And there we have it. The technique that, of converging lines um, was something I really wanted to kind of experiment with. And in some respects, it, it, it's not actually focusing on any particular thing. I just thought it was an interesting shape of the pier or the jetty kind of sort of just kind of almost disappearing into the, into the middle of the shot. And uh, I don't know, because it was so, so bright, um, I wasn't getting much detail. It was almost like, a, almost like a silhouette. And I thought it was really, really strong. The guy in the doorway is, is a stranger. I saw him move in, into the shot and I had to quickly move to get, to get it. I mean, I'd, I'd have loved the sun to be perhaps a bit more central um, in, the, in the frame, um, but what it is still doing for me is backlighting the subject, so I, I get a, a lovely warm glow, but it, it really silhouettes the tower beautifully. I shot in raw. Not a huge amount has been done. I played with the tint in terms of the temperature. That's brought the blues out in the sky. I've brought the blacks up a little bit uh, just to sort of really get a bit of a stark mood going on. Two days beforehand, I did a kind of a recce of the place, and I realised it was going to be boots job and muddy and getting wet. So I really know what I'm going to do before I sort of start the day of shooting, because I've already done all the homework, really. It was just as dawn broke, and in fact, the light was behind the windmill, really. The mist was providing an all-round kind of light. So I wanted the, those reeds to really be the sort of star of the show. But really, you think the windmill is, but that's a decoy. The, really, the photograph's about those fluctuating reeds. We're going to look at natural light, and we're going to look at the best way to photograph sunsets. So we're going to look at how to get really good colour into your sunsets. We're going to look at how to take good exposures for your sunsets. We're also going to look at metering on your EOS system. So we're going to see how to darken and lighten exposures. We're going to consider the principles of light. And outdoors, I mean, it is so varied. But first, we're going to look at working with direct and ambient light. To decide when to shoot a specific area can be quite challenging. Throughout the year, your light sources are going to change depending on the season that you're in. So it's a critical part of your landscape photography to go out and have a look at the location. At least you then know where your shadows are going to fall, you'll know whether you're using directional or ambient light, and you can plan accordingly. Ambient light is a soft, non-directional light source. You tend to get it early morning just before sunrise, late afternoon just after sunset. You also pick it up when you get a bit of atmospheric haze in the sky, when you get a little bit of cloud cover, or when you get a little bit of dust or smoke in the air. If you point your camera towards the sun, you're immediately going to get drama in the picture. But it could give you potentially lens flare. Lens flare is where the light source clips the front element of the glass, and it gives you that dramatic light source in your picture. It could be used artistically, or you might need to remove it completely. To remove lens flare, your best option is to use a lens hood, specifically one designed for the lens that you're using. As long as the shadow is falling over the glass element, you should be fine. If you want to remove reflections from water or from glass, your best option is going to be a polarizing filter. But keep in mind, there's no such thing as a free lunch in photography. So the moment you put the polarizer on, you take away a little bit of light and you have to account for that. Contrast is one of the biggest obstacles in your photography. There's a very big difference to what you're seeing to what the camera is actually recording. This will mean that your highlights will either brighten or your shadows will darken. 
and you have to account for that in your exposure as well. What is known as the golden hours is really the best time to shoot landscape photography. An hour or two after sunrise, maybe two to three hours before sunset, the light will diffuse through more of the Earth's atmosphere. You're going to get a lot more colour in the light. Your shadows are going to soften. It's a far better time to shoot your landscape photography. Shooting before dawn or shooting after dusk is going to present its own challenges. Light levels are going to fall. You're going to be working more with ambient light. Your exposures are going to become a lot longer. So you're going to need a tripod. Um, you're going to need a cable release. But really it's worth it because your photography here can become very dramatic. One area we haven't looked at in detail is light meter readings. Your EOS in-camera light meter reading system will help you to assess the correct shutter speed and aperture that you would need at the ISO you've set to take a good exposure. The light meter measures reflected light. That's basically the amount of light reflecting off your subject. By being able to take readings from different areas of the picture, you'll be able to control the areas you want to expose correctly. Let's shoot this beautiful landscape. In the foreground over here, there's some lovely rocks. We're looking down over a valley and some mountains in the background. Shutter speed and aperture settings that I've chosen for this picture, an aperture of f22, which is going to give me nice extensive depth of field. That's going to give me a shutter speed of 30th of a second, which should be fine because we are using a tripod. The ISO is set at 400, and the lens that we're going to shoot on is a 10 to 22 mil. That's effectively around about a 16 millimeter on this camera. Let's take a shot and see what we get. Here we got a nice even spread of light. Composition is looking really good. This photograph has been taken using the evaluative light meter reading. The problem with that is that it's taking an average reading. But if you want to expose a particular area, take a specific reading from a specific area that you are trying to highlight. So I'm going to take a reading of a green area. That's going to give me something in between the two, and that should clear up the exposure and give me exactly what I'm looking for. That is much better. The spot meter reading has changed my shutter speed from 30th of a second to 100th of a second, which has given us a much better photograph. We've now turned to take a different composition. I'm going to try to zoom in a little tighter on some trees on the horizon. It's a little bit side lit, so it's a bit tricky lighting. Uh, I'm going to use, to get in a little bit closer, the 70 to 300 millimeter lens. I'm going to use it on 200 millimeter. Um, shutter speed and aperture settings. Here specifically, I'm going to use a wide open aperture to try to get a little bit shallower depth of field. So the camera's light meter is indicating a shutter speed of 500th of a second at an aperture of f5. Your camera has some great built-in functions to assist you with exposure. In your camera's viewfinder, you will see a sliding scale. It's marked minus two on the one side, plus two on the other side, zero in the middle. Zero, it's indicating correct exposure. On the LCD screen, you have a slightly larger scale to work with. I'm going to take a photograph where the sliding scale is right in the middle. Let's see what we get, and let's see how we can improve it after that. The exposure is good. I think this will look a lot better if we take away a little bit of light by underexposing it. I've moved the scale down to around one and a half. Let's take another picture and see what we get. By underexposing it by one and a half f-stops, the picture has darkened a lot more and it looks a lot more dramatic. This means it's fine to override your camera's light meter. The camera's light meter is just going to tell you what is correct exposure, but for creative exposure, whether you want to lighten or brighten, means you can move off what the light meter is telling you to do. Sunsets and sunrises are probably the most iconic landscape photographs that you're going to take. We're down here at Nurtuk Beach. We've got a beautiful sunset going down behind us. We're all ready to shoot. As far as planning is concerned, really that is the essential part of this. Have a look and see what time of the day the sun is going to set, where it's going to set. Have a look for atmospheric conditions. As you can see, we have some beautiful cloud cover that's been forecast for this evening. And, uh, and that's going to add a lot of drama to the picture. As far as the, the shutter speed and aperture settings, 
There's two options. Now, while there's still a little bit of light around, we're still able to freeze some movement. So I'm going to try that. Thousandth of a second, maybe two thousandth of a second. ISO is still at 100. And uh, aperture is about 4.5, which is fine. There's more than enough depth of field for that. Exposure looks quite good, but we're starting to lose a little bit of color. So I've got out a tobacco graduated filter. I'm going to drop a little bit of tobacco color into the sky, try to give it lifted a little bit, make it a little bit richer. It's starting to look really good. Unfortunately, once the tobacco goes over, you're going to find that the exposure is going to get a little bit darker. So I opened up another f-stop just to brighten it a touch. But the light's already started to fall. So we're going to either have to take the ISO up a little bit more sensitive. That's going to allow us to keep the shutter speed quite high. Or else we're going to have to look at shooting this with slow shutter speeds and getting a little bit of milkiness to the waves. All right, so what I've done is I've taken the ISO to 100. I have taken my aperture down to its smallest aperture to cut out as much light as possible. My shutter speed now is around about a quarter of a second. Yeah, wow, that looks fantastic. That was worth waiting for. The light has fallen enough. The whole foreground has become really milky. Um, it's looking eerie, it's looking exciting. Ah, very happy with that. Working out in the natural world can be hugely rewarding. Ever-changing color of light, ever-changing weather conditions all bring on surprises. The only prerequisite is that you are here. You cannot rush this type of photography. Landscape photography takes time. It's all about adventure, it's all about exploring, it's all about being there at the right time. The most important thing is that you get to know your camera. At that point, you're going to see that things will start to come together. When those surprises happen, you're there to catch them. In this next section, we're going to be concentrating on all aspects of shooting water. Water can be a really fascinating subject, whether it's still or moving. Waterfalls, rivers, lakes and seas all provide their own challenges and rewards. So I'm standing here on the shores of a beautiful lake in the middle of the Lake District. We've got great reflections, we've got fantastic light, and we've also got some clouds in the sky as well that are really making this a really special moment. So firstly, if I'm going to compose a scene like this, the first thing I want to do is throw away a bit of photographic convention and just try and keep the horizon right through the centre of the frame. So I'm firstly going to look through the camera, I'll line the shot up so that I've got my horizon right through the middle there and zoom myself into the image. So I'm using a 10 to 22 lens used on a crop sensor, which means it's the equivalent of 16 to 35 mil on a full frame sensor. And it gives such a large wide angle field of view that I can maximize my shot by getting sky all the way down to the foreground in focus as well. So I'm going to go into live view and I'm going to check the focusing to make sure that I'm pin sharp 100%. Go through, I can zoom in to the screen itself and just check my focusing is nice and sharp. We've got a bit of a problem going on here with light levels between the sky and the water itself. The water's almost absorbing, if you like, some of the light reflecting off it. So what I can do is, is use some filters. I'm going to use something like 0.6, a soft step, neutral density. And this is going to just drop the light levels down enough so that the water and the mountain scene behind will balance up perfectly. Now it's all about aligning it within the viewfinder, so I've got to look as I drop the filter down, and there we have it. We've got some good light levels there and good balance. Now, at f16, I've got a shutter speed of a 25th of a second, because what I want to do is reduce any possibility of rippling within the reflections. Final compositional check. Press the button. Two-second timer. And there we have it. Shooting moving water like seascapes or waterfalls can be very tricky, but it certainly does offer us creative options. The one option, if you have enough light around, is you can freeze the water using a faster shutter speed. The other option, when the light starts to fall, 
you can actually start to blur the water and create these really misty, creative pictures. To do that, I recommend you use a less sensitive ISO. 100 would be fantastic, but some cameras even have 50 ISO. You'd also need to make sure that you have very little light around. The other thing you can use as well is an ND filter. This is a filter that you drop in front of your lens and it will cut out some light. So you'd be able to reduce your shutter speed from let's say one second all the way through to 15 seconds or even 20 seconds. The longer your shutter remains open, the better the effect you will get. The other equipment you're going to need to be able to do this effectively is a very good sturdy tripod to hold the camera steady throughout the exposure. And I also recommend a cable release. This will allow you to fire off the exposure without touching the camera, minimizing any camera shake in the picture whatsoever. Realize that your, that your water is going to blur completely. That means you don't really have to focus on that. What you've got to focus on is more the surrounding information. Also, as the light falls dramatically, it does give you the opportunity of bringing in another light source. This could really add a lot of dimension to your picture. Just by using a torch that is strong enough, while you're busy exposing for 20 seconds or longer, you can brush the torch over the darker areas of the picture and start to highlight them. This also is going to create a wonderful look to the picture and it's going to bring a lot of detail into the dark areas where you might have lost that completely. These photographs where you are blurring start to get interesting when the shutter speed becomes a lot longer. I would say anything from 15 seconds and beyond, we're starting to, to really get what we're looking for. In fact, you could even take it all the way up to 15 minutes and it will just keep on adding and adding to the feel of the picture. Mastering the techniques in this chapter will give you the skills you need to cover any shoot in any location. By building up your equipment, you'll be able to take full control of your photographs and the range of kit available will really help improve your photography. But it's understanding each of those pieces of equipment that'll give your pictures the edge. I thought, wow, this, this will be a great shot. So uh, having not had the camera long, I was a little bit annoyed that I didn't have a tripod with me, but you know, I uh, wedged it on my bag as, as best I could and experimented with uh, various shutter speeds. And I was expecting to have to open it for quite a, quite a lot lengthy time, but it was almost the reverse. The, the, the water was so fast that um, I think it was only kind of sort of a quarter of a second. So, um, it, 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 you know, that really surprised me. Well, this picture is the steps going down to the beach in, uh, in Brighton. And I've been taking a lot of photographs in Brighton over a period of a whole year, at different times of the year. And I've always been fascinated by shadows. Shadows, to me, are wonderful because shadows tell you something which you can't see. And those iron railings do make terrific shadows. And I've been going back at different times of the day to get the right angle. And that one was taken, funnily enough, quite late in the morning. That image is taken in a, in a local uh, forest to me. I just bought some ND filters and I really wanted to take some shots of a waterfall and I couldn't believe it was literally a mile away from where I lived. Um, so I went down there uh, with all my kit, uh, put some boots on and, and got into the water really. To get down into that waterfall, it was quite dark in there anyway. Um, so the, the shutter speed came down, but once the NDs were on, um, yeah, I could really slow the shutter speed down and, and capture the movement in the water. Welcome to the secrets of successful portrait photography. In this chapter, we'll be finding out how to get the most out of your kit when photographing people and how to achieve the look that you want. I'm going to be working in the studio to show you how to operate in a controlled environment. And then we'll be on location with our expert, Heather Buckley. She'll be showing you how to get the most out of your kit in the field. Finally, we'll hear from some of our enthusiasts to find out what they've learnt and see how they got on. But first up, the fundamentals. There are three main types of portrait photography. Firstly, formal portraits, weddings, sittings, headshots. There's a very specific style that you'll need to give to these photos. 
Secondly, creative portraits. These allow you to be a bit more candid with your camera. You might use effects, but it's all about interacting with your subject to take complete creative control of your output. And thirdly, it's reportage. This is about you observing the world through your camera. If you fully understand the lenses and the cameras, you can use them to create images that tell a really good story. Shooting portraiture indoors and outdoors can give you very different results. However, with the right understanding of equipment, you can completely control those results and your images. Shooting indoors can present low light problems, but using available natural light can work very well. It's important to understand how to manage this light by using tools such as reflectors to bounce natural light and make your exposure even and clean. When you're shooting outdoors in bright sunlight, you might not immediately think using a flash would be a good idea, but by incorporating a few flash techniques, such as filling in the subject while backlit by sun, or by working in shadows and picking out details on your subject, you can get really dynamic images. There's a huge variety of lenses available with different focal lengths and different aperture ranges that produce very different results. So let's take a closer look at how focal length will influence your images. You can shoot a portrait with any focal length, but with some consideration, you'll achieve the best results. A wide angle lens does allow you to get really close to the subject, but it can stretch the features of the person in your photo. And if that's not the look that you're going for and you want something a bit more complimentary, then I'd recommend working at around 50 millimeters. With that in mind, the second lens you should probably invest in is a 50 mil like this 1.4. This is a really useful piece of kit and I use it all the time for portraits because it allows you to get close into your subjects and make them the focus of attention and not the background. In portrait photography, probably even more than in landscape photography, it's all about leading the eye to the detail that you want to pick out. Using a shallow depth of field is a really great way to do this and the 50 mil or the 35 are perfect tools for the job. They can open up the aperture really wide and you'll be able to completely blur the background, but more on that later. The longer your lens, the more your view of the background compresses, focusing your attention on the subject. And the ability to change lenses will add a new dimension to the creativity of your photography. Shooting the same subject from a variety of different focal lengths produces dramatically different results. From something really wide to a much longer lens, the EF range offers all the tools that you need to shoot the same scene from different perspectives. As we work our way through the lenses, increasing the focal length, we get closer to the centre subject and the background compresses, reducing our view of it. Try replicating the framing of an image with different lenses to really understand the effect of focal length. This shot was taken with an 85mm 1.8, but when you swap that to a 24mm, you see you have to move much closer to the subject to create the same frame, and the background behind them spreads out. My go-to lenses for portrait photography are always primes. I love the 35mm, I've got the 50mm in my bag, and I've also got the 85. All three of these lenses give you complete control over depth of field and pin-sharp shots every time. Portrait technique and composition are huge factors in taking great shots and shifting up from amateur to pro level. Next up, I'll be running through some great tips that could make all the difference. In this section, we're going to look at in-camera settings that will allow you to take full creative control of your output. Sharpness in the right area is the key to good portrait photography. When you're shooting people, you want to pick out the distinctive features of your subject to focus on. This is usually the eyes. So set the key focus points to the eyes and you'll be sure to get strong, sharp images. We mentioned depth of field earlier, but let's go into it in more detail because it's such a useful tool and it can make all the difference to your portraits. Depth of field refers to what's out of focus in your picture and also what's in focus. And it's controlled on your camera by the aperture setting. So I've got a 50 millimeter lens on here. And if I set the aperture to its widest setting, which is 1.4, that means there's a huge amount of light spilling into the camera. And in order to ensure a correct exposure, we need to offset that with a faster shutter speed. Working at f1.4 gives me a really shallow depth of field, and it means I can have just the model's face in focus. 
If I wanted to have the model and the background in focus, I need to increase the aperture to the other end of the scale up to about f16. Some lenses have a circular aperture diaphragm, which makes for really nice blurred backgrounds. This creates the soft shapes that sometimes known as bokeh, which is the Japanese word for fuzzy. The other factors affecting depth of field are focal length and subject distance. The longer the focal length, the shallower the depth of field, and equally, the closer the subject, the shallower the depth of field. Generally, prime lenses are the best option for portrait photography because they offer you the widest aperture. This EF 50mm lens goes down to 1.4 and equally the 85mm 1.8 is perfect because it will give you really nice crisp images that also have a fantastically shallow depth of field. Photography is essentially about light, and in order to make your portraits look how you want them to look, you have to be able to read and control light. There are three main types of lighting, ambient, constant continuous, and flash. Each is very different and gives a different range of results. Ambient lighting is whatever is available naturally. You can maximize this by positioning your subject close to a source of light such as a window, but often when shooting indoors, you need to add light to the image. You can do this in a variety of ways, the simplest approach being using reflectors to bounce and increase light on the subject. You can also add light using other sources, such as speed lights, flashlights, or constant lighting. These can be quite harsh if you're trying to replicate ambient conditions, but you can use diffusions to soften hard light hitting the subject. However, if you're looking to either replicate a scene or do something creative with your lighting, you can use a light source remotely off camera. This gives you much more control. If you're using a 6D, for example, which doesn't have a built-in flash, Canon offer wireless transmitters that are a great addition to a portrait shooter's kit. And the 650D can also fire wirelessly off camera with a speed light like the 320EX. Using your camera is about finding the balance between shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. There's a seemingly infinite number of possible combinations of these three elements, but it's vital that you understand each one in order to be able to take the photographs that you want. And once you can control those features within your camera, then you'll be able to take photographs with real impact. In this section, we'll look at how to frame your shots, consider the image, and what to prep before you start. These are hugely important elements of portraiture that will really help improve your work. I find the most important thing when setting up a shot is taking your time to actually look at the image through the viewfinder. A lot of people just look at the subject and then put up their camera to take their shot, but consideration is really important when setting up an image. When taking portraits, your position in regards to the subject makes a huge difference. If we frame up our model, we can see that if we look at her from below, it's not the most complementary angle, but it can give a sense of power to your subject. If we change our height and shoot her from above, we get a far better connection between the eyes and lens. This is a much more complementary angle to shoot portraits from. You can frame the subject in the center of the image to avoid distraction, but this can look a little boring and traditional. It's worth experimenting with different compositions. Placing the subject off to one side, for example, gives you a really nice image that's pleasing to the eye. Using the rule of thirds will give you a good starting point to create a strong composition. This should influence your framing every time you look through the viewfinder. So I've decided I'm shooting a portrait of Dominique. I'm using a 50mm lens because that won't distort the image at all. And I'm shooting at f1.4 because I want to drop the background out as much as possible. The picture's all about her, it's not about what's in the background. The question now is how much of the frame is she going to occupy? Well, there's really, there's no golden rule here, but you might as well try different widths. So we'll start really tight, just a classic head and shoulders shot. So Dominique, just look straight at me, nice and relaxed. There we go. That's a kind of classic portrait, but maybe you want to tell a bit more of the story. You want to show what she's wearing. So let's try and take a mid shot down to the waist. Your natural